Hello. On the show. It's Matt Forbeck. <laughs> hey, Matt Hi, Forbeck. Folks. How are you? How you doing? Thanks for having me up. Well, no problem. Clearly, you've been way too busy writing books to be a guest on Dragon Talk, so I'm glad <laughs> sure. that... Yeah, I do a couple of those. <laughs> yeah, we're we at were, least four at once. We were just talking to uh, uh, Mr. Bob Salvatore, and he was saying he had uh, uh, two books per year, and I'm like, oh, I think our next guest might have you beat. <laughs> He'll catch up someday. <laughs> <laughs> Slow. He's been at him longer than I have, so he's got more books, more novels total. But uh, but I'll catch him. I'll, yeah, if you keep it. putting out four at a time, you're gonna. He'll yeah, catch no. <laughs> About how many? How, how on, a, on a rough count, how many books do you think you've 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 touched in the years? Uh, you know, just for pure straight novels, it's something like thirty three, thirty four, and for uh, that's not counting these books here. Uh, if you talk about game books, like source books and such, yeah, and I write stuff like the Marvel Encyclopedia and things like that too. Oh, that's gotta uh, be fun. You gotta be over a couple hundred at some point. I'm not sure really. I have to Whoa. sit down. A couple so, hundred, that's insane. Well, I've been doing it since I was in college, right? So, um, you know, 30 years on now. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 28, 29 years on. Yeah, uh, eventually it catches up, and you end up with a whole bookshelf full of stuff. So, it's yeah. all good. For in, a sec- in an office with three secret doors. So exactly. I hear. That's what, that's the secret. <laughs> that's the it. secret is the oh, secret Oh, I've read doors. that book, The Secret. No. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so where, you went, did you go to school in Wisconsin? I went to the University of Michigan, actually. I grew up here in Wisconsin, which is coincidentally not very far from the birthplace of Dungeons and Dragons. Right. right. I grew up yeah. 45 minutes from Lake Geneva, which is where TSR used to be. And I often say if I had been a, uh, if I'd grown up in Southern California, I'd gotten into film. If I'd grown up in New York, I would have gotten directly into publishing or television. But because I grew up in southern Wisconsin, I got into games, right? I fell into the wrong crowd, <laughs> essentially. And, <laughs> and it's, it's served me well ever since, so I don't complain about it. I think it's the good crowd. What are I you talking know, about? that's the right no, no, crowd. I was uh, part of this group called the Illiterates, which was uh, Troy Denning and Doug Niles and Steve Sullivan and a whole oh bunch of other uh, Tim Brown and uh, Don Perrin. And then we have a whole uh, West Coast branch that meets out in uh, Seattle that's like Jeff Grubb and Steve Winter and a, a bunch of other folks. And uh, I just actually had lunch with uh, Doug Niles and Steve Sullivan this afternoon. Oh, so nice. Really? I seen them in a few months. So it was just great to catch up with them for a while. They're local? They're in Wisconsin? Yeah, Doug is actually living in Madison nowadays. He's got a grandson that he's doing daycare for a couple days a week. Oh, so sweet. And Yeah, he's, he's such a sweetheart. His wife teaches school out there. And Steve lives in Burlington, which is just down the road. And uh, in the same city as Rob King, actually, if you remember Rob. Wisconsin is a hotbed of I literary know. talent. <laughs> right. So uh, for, for, for folks who may not know what, what, what uh, uh, you know, uh, those, those, those uh, were, they, were those old uh, TSR employees or were they? Uh, those are. Those are all, almost all TS. Actually, every one of those was old TSR employees from back in the day. That's so crazy. Uh, you know, they include, like Margaret Weiss is still in the area, things like that. There's, yeah. there's a lot of folks that are still around here. Um, even from the old TSR days, uh, Duke Siegfried, uh, who was Uncle Duke, who actually did like the first D and D miniatures ever, still lives in Janesville, Wisconsin, twenty minutes north of me. And last I checked, was still playing in a jazz trio uh, a couple weekends a month. Oh, that's even awesome. though he's been, wow. been ill for a while, but he still gets out there and plays occasionally. He's Barred guy. through and through. Yeah, exactly. there you go. <laughs> Right. Probably the original inspirations. <laughs> That's where I mean. So uh, I haven't been to Gary Con actually probably since you and I played at a table uh, uh, yeah. many many years ago. Um, but that was the feel being in 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 Lake Geneva was that like everybody knew everybody and and old TSR employees were still there and and even folks who just worked at the sandwich shop were like oh yeah I have, everybody had stories about uh, uh, TSR and those and 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 what it was like for for that time in the eighties. Oh those yeah stories. those were glory days. I mean I grew up around here. I never actually worked in the offices, but I was freelancing for uh tsr back in the in the 90s even early 90s mm. and actually even when i was 16 years old i had a uh i started a mini magazine i had my own gaming magazine when i was 16 years old my dad says you either need to get a job or get a start a business and i said well, i hate working so i'm going to start a business and i'll start a gaming magazine and i went into <laughs> the tsr offices and interviewed uh dieter sturm who was their vp of communications back in the day and mm. there i am like 16 years old playing notebook and learning my little recorder and trying to keep track and catch up with everything. Oh, I, yeah, I had my own booth on that year, actually, at uh, the year I turned 17. And I lost every dime I had on this magazine. It was about $1,000 <laughs> I had been saving for college. But oh. it turned out to be the best tuition money I ever spent, right? I learned more money doing that than I did on any course I ever took anywhere else. Oh, for so, sure. Yeah, you learn by doing. There. Yeah. Definitely. Very ambitious. 
That's crazy. So are you a lifelong gamer? Did you grow up, play, or when did you first discover D&D? &D? I started with Dungeons and Dragons back when I was about 13 years old. A friend of mine across the street, uh, his mother picked it up for him at Kmart on a blue light special, believe it or not. Hey. And he gave it to him for Christmas. And we kind of didn't get into it until summer break. And then suddenly uh, we started playing it. And like I got hooked immediately. And I think we were playing uh, basic Dungeons and Dragons, but with the advanced Dungeons and Dragons monsters and modules, which meant we got killed, we got slaughtered every day. So we played like every day all summer long and had to come up with a new party like about three quarters of the time because we'd have total party kills every time, right? And uh, we just got hooked at it. We had a ball just, uh, and to this day, that kind of sustains me. Those are uh, just the kind of fun I had at that age. You know, it allows me to, to I still tap into that when I'm writing books for Dungeons and Dragons and for other things. Oh. Yeah, it's all good fun. Yeah. Now, do your kids play too? They do. Uh, they don't play as often as they would like to. They want me to run a campaign for them, but I just haven't had enough time to actually sit down and come up with a campaign. Do it. Uh, we have a hard enough time playing things like Pandemic Legacy, to be honest with you, which are board games that have a series that you play with them. Um, By Rob Dabia. So, yeah. well, we, well, we do play at conventions. Every time we go to a convention, we go to Gen Con, we go to Gary Con, we go to Game Hole Con, whatever. Uh, we will actually sit down and play Dungeons and Dragons with whoever's running the, at that show. So, um, you know, we'll just set aside two or three sessions and then sit down and, and uh, go on through it and have a blast. So we never save the characters, right? They're, you're always supposed to do these things where you save the characters and move them on. We're like, ah, screw it. We'll start at first level again. Disposable. Yeah, yeah uh, right. That makes kill sense. Kill them all off. Just wipe the slate clean. We move on. So. Well, it's very convenient that you basically... Your family is a D and D party. <laughs> it is. So yeah. You were like, you know what we need? We need four kids, four exactly. books, four kids. Here we go. <laughs> I feel there's like one, there's a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, there's, and there's, uh, well, there's two girls there, now, and I have two, three boys and a girl in my group. But they'll, have, they'll figure it out. It's, yeah, they'll figure it out. Kind of gender free is one of these books. These, when I was writing the books, I mean, we all have characters for them, but uh, we try to make it so that when you're playing the books, the gender doesn't matter. It's really just. You get to play and get into it no matter who you are or what yep. you care about. So yeah. And immerse yourself in the fantasy and lose yourself. Yeah. There was, I was started reading one to my son, and he uh, was, at one point, he goes, Am I a girl? And <laughs> I was like, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Do you want right. to be? Like, we, it's up to you. It's fantasy. And he was like, No, I want to be a boy. I'm like, Okay, whatever. Like, I don't remember what I read that made him think like that he was girl but whatever you're comfortable with it doesn't yeah. matter you be you kid <laughs> whatever you want that but is exactly. i suppose we should talk about these books that oh yeah, yeah if we gotta, you know that's i suppose that's why you have me on here <laughs> <laughs> well there are there are, there are four amazing uh uh pick your path uh kind of books where you can uh choose where you're going to go uh in the story right? yeah exactly how how uh, difficult yeah. is it to write for that I can't rather even than imagine. An, a regular novel it's, it's really a challenge, but I mean, because I've done so much game design over the years, I started out in tabletop game design and then moved into writing novels later on. Uh, that, that's kind of a, a crossroads of which I'm comfortable, right? And it's not something that's very new to me. However, uh, when we decided to do these books, it was kind of strange because they came up with a page plan for me that actually was all done ahead of time. And I had to sit down and flow chart it all out so I knew how all the different decision trees worked. Um, oh, and one of the strange things about this is they, they also are planning at some point maybe to do a mass market edition of books, right? So when they did this, they said, we need to have a 128-page book, but the mass market edition will probably only have 96 pages. So we need to be able to rip a quarter of the pages out of this without anybody ever noticing that they belong there. Oh, my God. Wow. So that presented a bigger challenge for that. But, um, and, you know, who knows? Somebody like Scholastic or whoever will do Matt or Walmart will do mass market editions that are black and white all the way through and cheap paper and Three, you know, five dollars, whatever. If that ever happens, I really like the full color, full life. Yeah, these are beautiful. Now. But anytime you get to a point in the story where there's three choices, the reason there's three choices as opposed to two is because that was one of the choices that gets thrown away for the other book, the other oh. edition. So. But uh, I had to figure out, okay, this is the stuff, all the stuff in red over here, that stuff that can be thrown away, or the stuff that's regular over here, uh, that's blue or whatever, that stuff that we keep and be on all the editions. So. Oh my gosh. Um, but because you're, uh, that just meant the main storylines would go through the, the blue stuff. And the red stuff was more of the death and destruction and mayhem and misery and everything else that we're keeping. <laughs> That's one of the great things about writing books like this is you have, there's 26 different endings. And, you know, maybe a quarter of them are good triumphant endings, right? Um, but I want the kids to try to find them. I want them to try to look through them and fail often and early. 
and you know die in miserable ways like oh geez i made the wrong mistake and right. i'm gonna go here and just backpack backtrack to the last decision tree i had and make a different decision see where it takes me right these are books i don't want a kid to just read through once i want them to read through multiple times and see not only the exciting triumphant times but also the times when things fail miserably because i want those to be just as exciting and entertaining for the kid or whoever's reading them yeah. as it is uh the triumphant ones as well so do you think, I mean, obviously these were uh, uh, intended to be for all audiences, uh, yeah. but w what age do you think you would want, uh, you know, that, that, that is the sweet spot for, for right. letting people read these? The official age group on the back of the book is 8 to 12 years old, and I think that's perfectly fine. I tend to say 10 and up. There are, some of them are a little bit darker than others. None of them are terribly violent, and I've, I've seen people reading them to their kids who are as young as 3 or 4 or 5, even, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, whatever works for you, especially if you're a parent reading them to a child, you can editorialize and, and change things as you go if there's something that your particular child maybe isn't going to be comfortable with, right? Right. And, you know, having a number of children of my own, I'll, I know that it's about uh, every kid is different and every kid is more comfortable. You have to gauge their own personal comfort level with mm -hmm. these things. And that's part of being an involved parent is just figuring that stuff out. So it's a great way to get into these books and read them. In fact, at Gen Con, I did this and at Game Hole Con, I'm going to do the same thing where uh, I'm going to read through the books as a game event and we're going to, I'm going to do a, like a reading and then we're going to have the people at the table with me vote for which direction we go. Right? Oh, cool. Um, kind of change things up and, and maybe I'll juice things up as I go to and toss in little fun bits for people off the top of my head, just the way you would rip off any other normal game. I thought about doing that for uh, the live stream because I've been doing, you know, these D&D &D news uh, live streams yeah, yeah. on our, our Twitch and talking about Endless uh, Quest. And I read a few passages and I think the chat immediately was like, ooh, do story time, do story time. You should. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be really fun. They are so much fun to read. Thank Always. you. Yeah, I had a ball working on them. They're just, uh, you know, it, like I said, it's at the crossroads where I tend to sit, right, as far as yeah. games and um, and, you know, this is something that's Dungeons and Dragons is something I've been working with since the 90s, really. I, wrote, I used to write stuff for second edition way back in the day. And I wrote a bunch of stuff for third edition and uh, little for fourth and some now this stuff kind of stuff in the fifth edition era. And the Dungeonology book I wrote last year as well. Oh, that's so, another favorite in our house. Yeah, I just had a ball working this. It's just fun to get back to those things that you remember as a kid and then bring them uh, and maybe hopefully freshen them up for next generation so that we can be raising more and more little uh, dungeon masters and players as we go. Absolutely. Uh, I also like that these books tie in with uh, the Dungeons and Dragons lore from the last few adventures. Yes, that was actually a late development. Um, well, I got a book and a half into the series before somebody said, you know, we really ought to have these tie in with the Dungeons and Dragons lore, the latest modules and such. I'm like, oh, that's really smart. I wish you'd said that to me like a month and a half ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I ended up, uh, the first book, fortunately, which was To Catch a Thief, was was uh, something that melded well enough into the lore already. And then there was a second book, which I don't even remember what the heck we were calling it anymore. But I ended up throwing it away and then you know cannibalizing parts of it mm -hmm. for other books that I ended up writing. But they all ended up working up really well with the, with the current lore. And I think it was fun to be able to riff off that and find pieces of the adventures that I thought were going to uh, kind of glow in these, these uh, pick-a-path books. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, right. So the so the cleric uh, uh, one into the jungle very much has to do with Chult and the, uh, what was going on in the, the Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah, but there's an artist Simber subplot that goes throughout that. That's one of the characters from uh, the Harpers and the Forgotten Realms books that Jim Lauder did many years ago. So nice. Uh, nice. So it was neat to be able to pick up threads of that and weave that into the story as well. Did you know those books uh, back when those were coming out? I, I knew of them. I didn't read all the books. I mean, it's impossible to catch up with all the D&D &D books, right? But actually, <laughs> Jim, Jim wrote me earlier, and he's like, why didn't you talk to me about this? I'm like, oh, I should have. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, of course, because you had that network of, of old yeah, school exactly. employees. Oh, I'm yeah. sure you would have been able to get in touch with them. Jim lives in New Berlin, actually. We go out and see a, a Brewers game about once a year or so. And, nice. Uh, yeah, it's, it's neat to hang out with these guys. And there's John Kavalik and Bill Bodden and Matt uh, McElroy and Monica and Bell. It's an LA up in Madison, too. We just... We, we end up getting together and doing social stuff as well as playing games. It's, it's a lot of fun. That Plus the whole really Chicago fun. division, too. I end up doing a, uh, a freelancer's party. I haven't done it in the last couple of years, but uh, because of snow or, or deaths in the family or whatever. But we usually around Christmas, we'll have a freelancer's party where everybody meets in Beloit because it's between Madison and Chicago and Burlington and whatever. And we all come here and have a big dinner and just hang out with each other for a night. Uh, because as freelancers, we don't get holiday parties, right? We have to make our own. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's why freelancers unions exist is for holiday exactly. parties. Exactly. 
Exactly. And as writers, you don't really get to see, well, you have a big family, but a lot of writers are just by themselves a lot. So it's kind of nice to get out and uh, talk exactly. to people. Whenever I go to a convention, I'm like, oh, you just let me out of my cage. I've been sitting in here. <laughs> With human my wife contact <laughs> i oh, need it i need it now <laughs> are, you, are you real <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's it's a lot of fun i like going to conventions and doing that kind of stuff gen con's my big favorite obviously but all of them i uh, get to manage to go to are fantastic yeah so you're this, just we were when uh we were talking earlier you were talking about the diana jones uh awards uh yeah. and uh how that wh- where, where did that come from uh, the, the diana jones award was originally a uh, trophy that james wallace who's a game designer over in england found himself in possession of it. turned out that it was actually uh, created by TSR UK, believe it or not, way back in the day, after they closed down the entire uh, branch of the company and everybody was fired and let go. They took a copy of the Indiana Jones role-playing game and they burned it, oh. right? And Jeez. the only part of the logo that was left was the part that said Diana Jones. So they actually took this and encased it in a plexiglass pyramid and put it on a base, on a wooden base with a little uh, uh, plaque in the front of it that says Diana Jones Award. And uh, this became a pub trivia trophy that passed back and forth around England for a while in London. And somehow James ended up with it. And he's like, well, I have a trophy. I should come up with an award, right? And so he did. So he came up with the Diana Jones Award, which is uh, the Diana Jones Award for Excellence in Gaming. It's basically for anything that the secret cabal of people that do this uh, thought was most excellent in gaming that year. And the first year it went to Peter Atkinson, and it's gone to lots of other people since, uh, uh, you know, uh, Oh, so there's so many people. There's uh, Jordan Weissman. There's uh, Irish Charity Gaming Auctions won it one year. Uh, I think Eric Lang won it one year. It's been through a lot of different uh, people over there. Uh, Tabletop by Will Wheaton won it one year, actually, too. And that was a lot of fun. Nice. This year, it went to Actual Play, which is you guys know is doing streaming on Twitch. It's been a huge mm-hmm. movement within tabletop games over the last couple of years. And we kind of thought it, it had reached a point where it's just blasting the doors off things. Um, but this started out as just this, tr- this trophy with a bunch of guys on a mailing list. And uh, it happened to be uh, Gen Con 17 years ago. It was my, 30, my 20th Gen Con in a row. I've been going since I was a kid. And my 33rd birthday happened to fall on Gen Con that, that year. So I'm gonna, I had a big party that year uh, with money for, that was given to me by George Bush as part of the, <laughs> the Bush bucks, the rebate dollars we were given back in 2000, 2001, whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm going to use this money, not because I wasn't a big believer in George Bush. So I'm like, I'm going to use this money to throw a party for my friends. So I bought barrels of beer and boxes of pretzels and had a big beer and pretzels party for Chen Kai. Nice. And uh, James stood up and said, can I get, I don't really have any way to do this. Can I give out my trophy at your party? And he said, I said, sure, of course. So he stands up on a chair and he has Peter on another chair and he hands Peter the trophy. That was <laughs> the beginning of the Diana Jones Award. Uh, and people liked the party so much, we decided to move it to Wednesday night before Gen Con, where uh, it, it's where everybody's gone and set up. All the different professionals are welcome to show up. And if you've gone and done booth setup and you had dinner and you just want to have a beer with your friends, you come to the Diane Jones Award party. And we just basically sit around and drink all night and then stop everything for about 10 or 15 minutes and hand out an award and then go back to the drinking and catching up with everybody. Nice. And I pass around the hat nowadays to a lot of different companies. And I get a few thousand dollars so we just basically spend on drink tickets and i hand those out to the door to everybody who shows up and it's just my way of saying hi to all my friends because gen con's now gotten so big that if i don't do this the only chance i'm going to see a lot of people is to book time with them right because there's just no way to just randomly bump into people anymore because <laughs> they're you know eighty thousand people show up so and if you do uh, someone's so, always got something to go somewhere else or yep. you know there's yeah, exactly. you're, you're making them late for something food, they got <laughs> business or whatever yeah so this way i get to actually say hi to everybody and then you know you know, wish them well as they go off and, and uh, do battle against the hordes of gamers that show up at the doors of their booths. So, yeah. It's all. That sounds fun. Yeah. I dig it. And yeah, thank you. Uh, where, are you for the actual play award? I mean, I just seemed like it, it made sense uh, this time around, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. I thought, uh, you know, there were a lot of other great contenders. Uh, Harlem Unbound was a crowd favorite. Chris Spivey's game that he did, which is uh he takes the H.P. Lovecraft racism from Call of Cthulhu and flips it on its head and turn and plays a game that's set in the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, Amazing stuff, right? Yeah, I saw the art. The I haven't read through that book, but the art yeah. style for it is fantastic. And I and it I, is. I, I love, perfect, right? and it uses the Call of Cthulhu rules, right? Yep, it's it like does. A, you can also do Trail of Cthulhu as well, right? Which is a, a gumshoe variant that Ken Height did for Hell ah, Green right. Pass. Green Press. Um, and there's a number of other really wonderful. Uh, uh, finalists as well we do a short list every year yeah that we come out with about a month before the the finals 
Um, but you know, it was neat. We had uh, Satine and Rudy came up and accepted the award along with Ivan Van Norman. And I'm going to forget his name. He does the one shot podcast. Um, James D'Amato. Thank you very much. Yes. So James showed up and the four of them got up on stage and kind of collectively wound up with the trophy and, and gave speeches about it. And then uh, Ivan wandered off with the trophy. So I think he still <laughs> got it at the time, but I'm hoping to actually be able to uh, have it shipped back and forth. So uh, all the different podcasts or a number of the most prominent ones, at least can have it and show it, and, you know, say, Hey, look at this cool thing uh, that we got here. So, cause it's kind of this neat artifact of history and yeah. it's been through so many cool hands at this point too. I so love that. Think, I love that idea of a, of a trophy that's passed from, I know, from, it's from, really from cool. thing to thing. I think that's really neat. It's like the Stanley question. cup. Actually, we got it back yeah. every year. I can't believe it. Right. Yeah. I, some year somebody's going to wander off of there and lose it. Or one year I forgot it back at home and had to have it FedExed out to me and, yeah. Uh, one another year, a guy had a nervous breakdown and didn't show up with it, but somebody showed up a couple of days later with it. So. Oh my nice. god! Now I'm worried about it. It all, it all shows up. So <laughs> I'm worried about it getting like melted down again and then like reformed into something else. Like yeah, that's there's that. yeah, it's clearly been dropped a couple of times. Right? <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, that just adds character to it. We're okay with that. Right. So. Put some put some gum and glue on it, and you're good. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Why not? Exactly. Like nobody ever dropped the Stanley Cup. <laughs> The Stanley Cup's been broken a few times. I mean, I mean come obviously. on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they keep adding to it. I mean, it's getting almost exactly. impossible to hold over your head now. Wait, is it cursed? I didn't know it was cursed. Is it actually cursed? The Diana Jones Award? Or no, someone said, said that in the chat. Stanley Cup, maybe. But oh, okay. I don't think the Diana Jones Award is cursed now. Maybe, you know, so far, you know, nobody's died while it's had, they've well, had it in their Let's hope not. It's not like the Madden cover, uh, right? Where right. Nothing like that, right? <laughs> like, uh, Jason Morningstar has actually won it twice. He's the only guy who's won it twice. Ooh. Oh, that uh, you have repeat, repeat winners. For Fiasco and for... Uh, it was Gray... Oh, God, what was the one? Something Gray something. It was a, a game about uh, surviving in Poland in World War II. Ooh, right? neat. Fantastic game that he did. And Jason's just an amazing designer in, in a lot of different ways, right? Uh, Robin Laws has been on the shortlist a number of times, too, and I think... Uh, what was the name of the game he did? Uh, the drama assistant game. I can't remember the name of it. Too many things coming at me at once. But uh, <laughs> Were you just looking at your shelf? You're like, maybe I if trying. I could see myself from here. <laughs> I, I actually wrote a little bit for the book, right? So I'm like, oh, maybe it's over there. <laughs> no worries. I got a couple bookshelves full of stuff I worked on here. And, um, and uh, that's one of his games. I just He ended up, for the Kickstarter he did for that, asking a lot of his friends to just pitch in like one or two page settings. So I did one of those for him. So. Very um, cool. Hill Folk. Hill Folk. That was the name. Of Hill Folk. Hill yes. Folk. That rings, that rings all the bells. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, we just honor whatever we thought was cool. Like I said, one year it went to Irish chair, Irish Game Convention Charity Auction. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I had never heard of such things. What is, what is well, that? Uh, so, like, GaleCon and WarpCon, which are two of the big uh, gaming conventions in Ireland, they have these charity uh, auctions that raise, like, literally tens of thousands of dollars in a single evening from just gamers sitting around, you know, ready to throw money at stuff. Right? Sweet. And, uh, then they end up donating it to all sorts of different really worthy causes over in Ireland and abroad. Uh, so we thought that was something that was just amazing to see gamers doing good like that and that kind of a scale. Right. Yeah. And you know, that was several years ago. So now we see things like the, you know, the extra life stuff that you guys were talking about uh, where you, 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 people get together and raise money for children's hospitals and such. And I think those were wonderful things too, but this was, kind of a unique thing at the time when it came out that people were doing this kind of stuff and using games for, for doing that kind of good, which I think is one of those things that helps legitimize the hobby. You know, it's something you do not just for yourselves, but for public good. I think yeah. that's always. Are you, so yeah, are you going to be at uh, game hole con this year? It's right in your back. I am going to be at game hole con. I'm one of the guests. So uh, I, I uh, end up doing two or three different events there and uh, wandering around with my kids and playing a lot of different games, but. Uh, but if you guys need help there or something, let me know. I'd be happy to jump in. It's always, Absolutely. I always have a blast doing that kind of stuff. It's cool. amazing. I'll be there. You can help me um, play Dungeon Mayhem, our new card game. There we go. I would love to actually learn how to play. So All right. I'm a game design geek from way back. I mean, I'm a terrible game player because as a game designer, I only play a game so I can figure it out. Yes. And I don't ever play a game to get good at it. I've, right? I've played uh, games with game designers. No offense. Yeah. They're not fun to play with. <laughs> they start talking about the mechanics this halfway is broken. through. I would have done it this way. Or they try to break it and see what happens. Like, can we just play? Exactly. Come, come like, on. Just you're like dissecting it as you yeah. go. Yeah. Right. Maybe not why you should be there, right? Um, yeah, but you can read books without 
well, can you read and enjoy a book without editing it? It, it took me years because actually when I started out with TSR back in the day, I started out as an editor. I actually edited for New Infinities for Gary Gygax, which was his second company nice. after uh, after TSR. Uh, so when I was in college, I was doing book editing and novel editing and game editing. And it took me years to be able to put that away and get back up to reading at speed where you can just let all the words go past you. Just for pleasure. yeah. Just for pleasure, as opposed to... Yeah, I don't like the sentence structure here. <laughs> <laughs> I do that not where I thought the plot was going. Enough, or where the hell did that come from? Or yeah, so it's nice to be able to. I'm at a point now where I haven't done too much editing over the last several years. So I, I used to do that with uh, yeah. with going to see theater all the time. It was very impossible for me to just go and enjoy it. I would be like, oh, that lighting design is off, or like, oh, I can see that person in the blacks behind there doing that thing, <laughs> and or, you know, they're they're using their their micro uh, mic- microphones, their um, flashlights too high. I can get in the flash is distracting <laughs> me from what's going on on stage. I would be uh, such a, a critic about it, but then yeah, right, you get you get used to it after a while, and you start to be like, I can just be an audience member and turn yeah. off that part you of your brain. that stuff, right? It's yeah. tricky. But otherwise, you're you're ruining the reason you got into this in the first place, True. right? Which is you know the joy that you had for theater or games or novels or whatever. Um, and I, I think it's just amazing to be able to to step back and just uh, let yourself enjoy that in a new way again. But I also think it's valuable to figure out ways to enjoy those technical aspects too, right? I mean, one of the reasons I think I've been able to make a long career as a writer is because I actually enjoy the process of writing, right? It's a lot of people like to like to have written a book; they like to have finished a book. Huh. I actually enjoy the tinkering with the different sentences and phrases and getting the words just right and all that. Um, and the actual process of going through it, that actually is pleasurable for me. It's not painful. Wow. So I, one of the reasons I've been able to stick with it so long. And that's why you're so prolific as well. Yeah. That would help. Yeah. Right. Because uh, if I hated doing it, it would be pulling teeth the entire time. I know. And I think I'm in the I'm in the other camp of someone who likes to have written, uh, which is why I didn't get too far with my uh, uh, writing career. <laughs> 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 well, you know, some days are worse than others, right? Some days you just have to sit down and pull the goddamn teeth, and you know, and do the work and get it done. Yeah. Uh, but if you're if you're lucky and you actually enjoy the stuff, it you know, to me, it's. I also look at this as a very blue collar kind of a thing. I don't look at this as as an ivory tower thing. If I'm not doing this, I end up. I'm gonna have to go, you know, build houses or drive pizza or whatever, or dig ditches or whatever I'm gonna end up having to do. I've been doing this for long enough. I'm not qualified for anything else in the world, right? So, <laughs> I have to, I have to figure out ways to keep doing this. Um, and that's really pleasurable for me too. I mean, I also do video game writing too, and that's a lot of fun and that's a whole different genre and comic book writing and, and encyclopedia writing. So it's nice to be able to switch back and forth with all the different things as well too. Yeah, right. that is, that is a special skill set, though. I don't think mm-hmm. a lot of writers or authors have that ability to transfer their skills from, from one medium to another. I always find that kind of curious because to me, it's just storytelling, right? Uh, if you're a, if you're the kind of person who could sit down in a bar and tell somebody a story, you're a storyteller and you can transfer that over to any kind of a genre that you have, right? Mm. Whether it's film or television or playwriting or computer games or comic books or novels or short stories or whatever, it's all got the same nuts and bolts to it. It's really just about storytelling. You're trying to get people intrigued and, you know, foreshadow things and hit them with a good reveal just at the right moment. And that's really just about the same skills, again, that you would have telling stories around a bar or a campfire. Yeah, and I guess this dungeon mastering and playing in a, in a, a D&D campaign exactly. is very similar, right? You're doing the same thing, and that's why you know, we keep hearing from people in uh, you know, creative endeavors like writing or uh, in Hollywood when they're making stuff, like that everyone is just trying to get in on the next game because it's this fun activity, yep. but that also works their muscles of, of creativity. Yeah, I think it sharpens your skills, which is a fantastic thing. There's so many writers out there now that are like, oh, yeah, I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? And, yeah. Right? Because it's, it's, it's the thing. This For me, playing D&D, was, it was all before fan fiction. Nowadays, a lot of people write fan fiction to kind of get themselves into writing, right? Yeah. It'll, it'll, it's like the, uh, when, the, uh, when you learn how to paint, you do copies of the old masters first, right? And then you learn how to do your own thing. Right. And it's the same thing with fan fiction. You learn how to write by doing copies of the, or your own versions of these things. But for me, it was playing Dungeons and Dragons. I never did the, the fan fiction thing because it didn't really exist as a thing back then. Uh, nowadays, if I was doing it, I probably would start out doing that kind of stuff. But still, I'd be involved in D&D and other role playing games. You know? Just games in general. I just think fire your imagination that way. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Like it just gets that imagination fired. Yep, yep. That's why I want my kids to do it as early and often as possible. You got to get them reading the. This is like the perfect introduction to being a dungeon master and a player. Yeah, you think so? Mm-hmm. Is that what it's been like with with Quinn? Yes, but like you were talking about how you you know your kid and you have to kind of like you know. Yeah. But like Bart and I are very very different. 
And huh. when Bart comes to a part of the book where it's like, oh, nope, didn't work out, he'll like <laughs> kind of like change it and make it still be something kind of cool where I'm like, oh, failure. Sorry. <laughs> Pick the next option. And he's right. fine with it. He actually likes the failure part of it. He's of like, course. oh, no way. Like he blacked out and a toad ate his face or something. I it's don't know. It's so funny how you you and Bart are, are like the, totally the opposite different. of how. Bart can never like just let him lose. We were playing Go Fish. And Bart was like, oh, let's just put all of our matches in the middle. I'm like, no, let's play a game. You let's have to learn how to lose, lose a little bit, right? my God. No, my wife is always like, oh, don't let them climb up. They're going to fall. And I'm always like, no, let them fall. They'll be fine. Yeah. Like, you have to learn how to fall. To kinda, yep. Yeah. I, yeah. So these are, these are also good in teaching your kids winning and losing and there success and failure. But he's having a great time with them. He's even trying to write his own books now. Oh, fantastic. He really likes to just like throughout the day, he'll just be like, Mommy, do you face the toad or do you die? I'm like, oh, is, are those my choices? <laughs> I think I'm going to face that toad. Yeah, what's up, toad? <laughs> I don't know. He's obsessed no, no, with it. I want to die. Tell me what happens. I know. That would be interesting. We've never no, chosen that one. Yeah. See what he go, comes up with. Everything is always whatever. Or you die. <laughs> so he's he thinking. Of, he's thinking about. He's uh, a good little dungeon. His master. own mortality, mm -hmm. as he should be. Yep. <laughs> uh, oh. So I don't know if everybody uh, listening knows this, but you have uh, uh, quadruplets, right? Is that why you wrote yep. four books? <laughs> no, no. Because they're <laughs> they competitive. <laughs> now I have uh, I have five kids. I got one who's a, a junior or sophomore at the University of Wisconsin right now in Madison. Uh, he's studying uh, creative writing or film video. He's not sure which. Isn't that where he Bart went? Yeah. Bart went to University and of Wisconsin Liz, in, in Madison, as well as Liz Shue from, from the D&D team. Go, Go Badgers. Um, and then we have uh, quadruplets who are now uh, 16 years old, and they're juniors in high school here. Mm. Uh, they end up going to Craig High School in, in Janesville, which is uh, where my wife works as a school social worker. It's about 20 minutes north of us. But because she works up there, she's like, oh, I know all the teachers and everybody else. I'll bring you up. And they have a great time. And it clears out my house for several hours of the day. So I get some writing. Done, which is yeah. Good. Yeah. Now that summer's over. Right. So uh, although we had a fantastic summer, I ended up uh, uh, after I left Gen Con, I was home for a few days and then I went off to Africa, actually, on a safari. Oh, um, no way. There was a uh, this group called uh, Forward Slash Story that does this um, uh, writing lab. It's run by uh, a guy who's a professor at Columbia in New York City and a woman who's a, a game designer in Australia. And they invite people from around the world to all, do all these transmedia things in different types of categories. And we meet for four days in some kind of exotic location and kind of bounce ideas off each other. So two years ago, I did it in Costa Rica. And this year, they brought me back as alumni. And we were in Lamu Island off the coast of Kenya. Oh, my actually. God. So I don't like, oh, I got the note. They're like, do you want to go to Kenya? I'm like, yes, I'm going to Kenya. <laughs> and my wife's like, well, if you're going, uh, I'm going. <laughs> And if we're, if we're both going, we should do a safari. So we did a, a safari for like six or seven days before that and then spent three days on the beach in Malindi, which is this little coastal town in Kenya. Uh, and on the way out, we spent two nights in Qatar, too, because they had some kind of crazy uh, – we flew Qatar Airlines. And there was some kind of a crazy deal where you get two nights in a five-star hotel for 50 bucks if you just do the stopover. So we're like, okay, oh, we're going to okay the, the Souk Wakif, which is the old market, and we're going to see the new mall that has the uh, indoor – uh, snow slide onto it, you know. It's, oh, cool! Uh, wacky, wacky. They have Angry Birds World. You know, wacky stuff. So, <laughs> uh, but it was an amazing trip. You know, we got to do that. We got to we get to Kenya and do the safari and see the Maasai warriors and uh, see all these different lions and, uh, and uh, leopards and, and elephants and zebras and all sorts of amazing things. It was just great, great trip. So I've only been home for about a week now, and I'm having. I just had a great summer. Amazing. That sounds really cool. Did you yeah. feel like uh, uh, you were uh, gonna like inspired about uh, writing stories where you're going on adventures oh, yeah. and places like that? <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna use a lot of this, right? <laughs> it's uh, yeah, no exactly. matter what. I'm doing, like, oh, if I'd only written uh, into the Jungle Book, now this would be so <laughs> right. That's what I, I was know, thinking. Right? There's a lot of inspiration there. Well, but, maybe uh, you can. I spent time in Costa Rica a couple years ago, so I'm like, oh, I know jungles from that. I can do jungles from Costa Rica. Figure that out. So, that makes sense. Where have you traveled? Where you um gotten your inspiration for the underdark ah, <laughs> all of well, the caving and spelunking <laughs> yeah, i've done some caving over there. there's the cave of the mounds up here in wisconsin which every 
grade school kid has to go to on their uh, field trip at one point. Oh. So we did that. Um, and, you know, just uh, my sister was a huge uh, spelunker for a while. Her and her husband would do this big festival in West Virginia every year and tell me about crawling through all the caves. Doing Dungeons and Dragons is nothing like actual cave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you don't God. have ten foot poles searching for traps. You don't have magic. Exactly, exactly. It's a bummer. And, you know, you're not trying to squeeze through these little spaces. They make you very claustrophobic. So fortunately, it's all ten foot poles. You can't, you're okay. But, yeah. Luckily, every cave in D and D has got ten foot wide uh, halls. It's it is. so weird. It is stunning. <laughs> the, the building codes they've actually established <laughs> for natural caves. Yep. Uh, so these four books, uh, you know, they're based on uh, different classes. So there's the wizard, a cleric, rogue, and fighter. But those are only four of the main classes oh. in Dungeons and Dragons. That's true. Any thoughts about uh, well, a warlock book, a bard book? I, I actually, uh, I've been—it's not been announced officially yet, but I've been clear to tell people. Oh, nice! Uh, I'm kind Breaking of news. I'm sure nobody will tell out here. No, I, I, it's just between us. Books, so I'm going to be writing two more for next year. Nice! Yay! And uh, we're we're actually right now talking about the classes and the races that we're going to be going after that. And uh, this week, I'm actually sitting down to do the outlines for those books. So we get the basic stories done, uh, what they're going to be about, where they're going to be set, and which of the different uh, D&D adventure sets that we're going to pillage for this, these stories. But um, uh, next week, I'll sit down and actually do the outline where I go through the, the uh, flowchart bit by bit and say, okay, this happens here, this happens here, this happens here. And then, you know, your wonderful friends over at Wizards will tell me I screwed things up and it's all <laughs> Um, and I'll come. It, we, there, that's part of the give and take of doing books like this. You know, you're always working with a team as opposed to doing it by yourself. Um, so it, that's actually part of the fun, right? There are people out there uh, who know these things better than I do, and they also know Wizards' plans for things for Dungeons and Dragons better than I possibly could. So I'm always happy to have their kind of help for these things. They they make sure I, they keep me on the straight and narrow, and uh, and and um, you know, basically are like an extra brain for me that I can tap into anytime I need extra help on that. For sure, right. So, we're, uh, what are you leaning towards for those two uh, extra ones, as far as classes goes? Can you do you know that? I think we're going with a rogue and a fighter, but we're going to do a swashbuckler instead of a fighter. Okay, uh, a straight fighter. So, um, and is that right? no, it's going to be a cleric. Is going to be the second one, a female cleric, is for for reasons that will become obvious once you see the the uh, uh, area that's set in, which I probably shouldn't talk about quite yet. Nah, that's yeah, right. Exactly. I know what you're talking about, though. <laughs> there you go. Do you, Shelley? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, all right. Well, then you should be answering the question or asking the questions. Tell <laughs> so me more. I, so I don't leave it. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he could. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. Well, that'd be very cool. I, I, I think there's a lot of e- expansion possibilities uh, with these uh, pick your path kind of books. You know, there's just so many. I mean, even continuing from one of the endings that and make them, you know, ca- mm-hmm. canonical to a certain extent and then move on. Exactly. I think there's a lot of different w- ways you can go here. I think uh, right now when I'm writing these, we're still in the process of figuring out, you know, how are these books doing? How many people love them? All that kind of stuff. It, it turns out that they're huge bestsellers, then I'm going to write boatloads more of them, right? And we'll have all sorts of different plans. If not, we'll do two more, and then we'll see what the heck happens after that. Yeah. Right? Uh, and that's how you always do things like this. You want to see, you want to experiment with them and see how, what, what strikes the chord with the audience and what doesn't. And, you know, obviously we all have to keep the lights on, so we need to be able to sell books to make that happen. Sweet. Well, I know uh, Kate Irwin, uh, the art director for these, had a great time uh, picking the pieces uh, and, and putting them all together. Yeah, to there's feel really cohesive. cool art oh, She did a fantastic job. I didn't even, thank you, Kate. I didn't know you were involved, but there you go. Uh, because I didn't have any say about the artwork at all, right? All I did is write the stuff up, and then she went out and found all the different pieces that matched up with everything. So good for her. Yeah. It really got assembled into something that looks uh, fantastic. So uh, it's, no, it's, it's, it's a full package with the text and the art and uh, the whole uh, packaging. These are hardcover versions uh, with a dust jacket, yep. uh, which cool. the dust jacket has some shiny shininess on it. Um, but there's also soft cover uh, editions out for everybody uh, yep. to check out. And what, what kind of have you gotten any feedback from uh, fans who've been able to pick them up and read them? Yeah, yeah. it's been really good. I mean, I, um, no, I've mean, had two types of feedback. One of the feedback is the same kind of feedback we have with Dungeonology, which is people are D&D fans will buy anything that says D&D on it, right? Which is freaking awesome. But if you're a 40-year-old grogner and you're like, click, it just said D&D, and then you get these books, you're like, oh, man, these are not rule books. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they feel a little you're misled. You're still going to read them. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
but most of the feedback we're getting is stuff like, uh, you know, I've been reading these and they cost me sleep or my kids now starting to play. My kids been asking about Dungeons and Dragons See? and I bought them the starter set. There it is. Oh, great. The that's gateway. The kind of feedback I really want to get, right? Um, anytime you get somebody who's interested in games, that's fantastic. And as a writer, if I cost you sleep, I think I've done my job. Right? For sure. To actually put the book down. That's fantastic. Do you ever do school visits? Do you ever get to like talk to kids about your books? Yeah, yeah, I have actually. Uh, yeah, I, usually I keep it local. And if anybody asks me, if it's a local group and it's friends of mine, I just I don't charge anything. I just show up there and spend the day talking to kids and uh, be, get them excited about reading. Yeah. Because right? I think that's a vital thing for for, uh, for kids of any age. But you know, reading is such an amazing thing. It opens so many doors for you. And if you don't read and if you don't like reading, you close off so much of the world to yourself. Yep. And if you could be inspired by some bozo walking through your school and telling you how cool things are, <laughs> showing you all the, the zombies in his books and all that kind of stuff, uh, then I think that's great. I mean, if I could do, make some kind of small contribution that way, that would get some kid inspired. Or often will be inspiring the kids who are thinking about writing to really take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And, to, you know, they might not make a career out of it, but just to take it on as a hobby and see if they enjoy it and, and pursue it in that sense, I think it's a wonderful thing to do as well. For sure. I think the, re the, the reason why, you know, uh, you might scare off the kids, though, is if you're wearing a clown costume, people think you're Bozo <laughs> yeah. walking through. That might not be. Th th all the kids you... have seen it at this point anyway, so it's, it's all. <laughs> oh. All right, then you're fine. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> they know. They know that that's where the knowledge comes from is from the clowns. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The guy in the sewer. Yeah. Keep away from him. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the coolest D&D &D books. <laughs> And secret doors. <laughs> and secret doors where he has uh, uh, treasures to behold. Exactly. Uh, very cool. Well, uh, I'm excited uh, to... I'm, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to make it to Game Holcom, but I'm thinking about uh, heading there myself. Shelly is Do going it. to be there. Yeah. You I need know. to go. Fantastic. You should come. It's a blast. Uh, the guys there are fantastic. They do True Dungeon there, too, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and they've got a number of other writers that show up, like Pat Rothfuss, and uh, last year was Mike Cole and Peter Brett and a bunch of other guys. Um I think Margaret usually wanders by, Doug Niles wanders by a bunch of the other ones. And uh, the, the team there, Alex Cameron and, uh, and Andrew Hitchcock and the rest of the crew, they just treat their guests fantastically well. They're really good about that, right? Uh, Alex is a, a, a huge collector of D&D &D material. So he's got like Ed Greenwood's original Forgotten Realms map. I know. He, he bragged about that when we, he had him on. He was very, yeah. very excited about it. Um, and he's also he also owns a couple of restaurants in town. So yeah. uh, the night before the show starts, he invites all the guests to his restaurant, and it's just a wonderful time to just catch up and have a beer and a burger and, and hang out with a lot of old friends. So it's always a lot of fun. That is cool. Yeah, and I, I'm excited to go back to that area. You know, like I think you mentioned where you know you, it's where you grew up, and I had this theory that a friend of mine actually uh, had where he thinks that the actual. I, mean, I feel like maybe we might have talked about this uh, last time you were on, but okay. it's worth bringing up again, and that the landscape of Wisconsin had a lot to do with uh, uh, the, the the being the birthplace of D and D uh, to a certain I'm extent. Surprised about that. I mean, it's it's not just Gary, but all the guys who are working with him, including Dave Arneson, is from Minnesota, right? Um, so you know, it's just that whole northern Midwest area. But you have this these large open tracts of land that are filled with lots of different uh, hills and, and areas to kind of explore. And you know, like I said, the Cave of the Mounds before. Uh, there's a lot of different places to do this kind of stuff. But also, it's so cold here in the winters. <laughs> yeah. Have to do right. Indoor so, fun. No, I really do think that that's one of the reasons the games uh, flourished in the Midwest is because. You have this long stretch of time in the middle of winter where, if, especially if you're not into winter sports and, you know, sledding, skiing, all that kind of stuff, you're just stuck inside by the fire for a long time. So to be able to do something that fires your imagination, gets your mind going, and, and, and something you can do with your friends that's good, clean, wholesome fun, as they say, or however you want to play it. It's, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I, I think that's one of the reasons that it, it took root here so strongly, right? And still does to this day. Yeah. It's glorious. And going back, I always get, I always start thinking about the, the, the uh, abandoned farmhouses on the horizon. You'd be like, oh, what's yeah. there? What's, what's in that place? You know, and you, it becomes. Kick the door down and find out. Right? Exactly. <laughs> That's what a D&D &D person would do. <laughs> right? right? Try not to kill the hunters inside the cabin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. They were like, we're squatting here, you know, <laughs> and then that's where all the fun happens in exactly. D&D. We have this role-playing moment. All great D&D adventures start in a barn with a kick-down door <laughs> and a group of hunters. Yeah, they actually, the, the whole tavern thing might be a Wisconsin thing, too, now. That Probably. <laughs> right? Because there was yeah. like there is like a German uh, uh, influx of, of Northern oh. European folks in that area, right? Yeah, in fact, one of the biggest lobbies in the state is the Tavern Society, right? 
uh, literally that uh, regulates things like drinking age and all that kind of stuff. Wisconsin was the last state in the nation that actually raised its drinking age to 21 because the tavern lobby was so strong in the state. They kept it at 18 as long as they possibly could. Wow. So, and, and they still are to this day. We have a long tradition, not just of neighborhood bars. Like if you go to Milwaukee, literally there are neighborhood bars in lots of different corners in the middle of residential neighborhoods, but also supper clubs, which are these things are just out in the middle of nowhere, really in a lot of places where you sit down, you have a brandy old fashioned and whatever the catch of the day is. Right. Yeah. So there's that kind of feel of that old tavern where there's, if you walk in and you don't belong in that area, every head turns towards you. Like where the heck, who are or, you? Yeah. Who's the stranger come to town? Right. He's must be an adventurer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the old man in the corner who wants to sell you a map. You know, maybe he's just trying to be a musky guy. We don't know. But, you know <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, it's worthwhile for uh, uh, folks to visit that area if you are in the uh, yep. uh, the gaming mind. Uh, there's there's tons of inspiration, even just the, the people that you mentioned uh, at, at Game Hall Con or Gary Con uh, as well is also in that location. Uh, yeah, Luke Guy Gax uh, has been doing it for years. There's a great book that uh, you should read. Mike Whitmer did The Empire of Imagination. Yeah. Theory and how he started Dungeons and Dragons. If you read that book, there's actually a map in the front of it that's done up like a D and D adventure module map that was done by Steve Sullivan actually. That shows you all the different areas in Lake Geneva that you can kind of go visit, right? Oh, so cool! Kind of neat, fun to be able to do this kind of historical trip. You can see where Gary's house was. You can see where the original dungeon hobby shop was. You can go out to where the TSR offices used to be, uh, and especially if you come in for Gary Con, uh, people will actually wander around and show you around these places. Too. Yeah. It's like a map to the stars, but it's a yeah, it map is. to the gaming stars. <laughs> it's gaming history, yeah. Yeah. That's totally it. That is very cool. Yeah, I love that uh, um, uh, graphic novel that uh, uh, Mike Whitward did. That It was, it was amazing. And uh, I'm excited that he's now doing uh, uh, an Arcana. With... Oh, the Ar Arcana crew. What a good crew of people. Too. Yeah. And, uh, John was showing me some of the stuff. John Peterson was showing me some of the preview stuff at Comic-Con. It was fantastic. Yeah, that right? book is I'm really stunning. excited about that book, right? And uh, I was on a panel with Kyle Newman, and I got to finally meet uh, Sam Whitwer at Gen Con as well. So I, I, I collected all four. They're great people. <laughs> uh, it's just neat to hang out with them. They're really wonderful, excited guys who are really thrilled about these things. It's kind of funny the amount of celebrities we now suddenly have doing D and D material, right? Mm -hmm. we, uh, and you got uh, Sam and Kyle, but you had uh, uh, Joe Manganiello who's right. doing the death save stuff, and Matthew Lillard doing his things too with uh, the exclusive, you know, five hundred dollar box set that's coming out for Dragon Heist and for the Water stuff. Yeah, that Platinum Edition looks so cool. Oh, it's just beautiful stuff, right? I saw some of it at Gen Con. It's just stunning. Yeah. Right? It's like people are coming out of the closet and saying, ah, I'm a D&D &D player. Not only am I a D&D &D player, I want to make money doing this, providing really cool stuff for my fellow fans. How cool is that, right? I know. I, I would not have predicted it. You know, nope. it was, didn't see that one coming. As little as like three yeah. years ago, I don't think we would have predicted this. And it's, yeah, it's exactly. yeah. And it, and uh, part of that's the actual play thing. It's, it's just, it's made it such a, a thing that you get these voice actors on, they're doing stuff, and they make it look so much fun and so cool in a way that, you know, um, it was hard to communicate this stuff in a rule book. Oh, you, yeah. You, know, you had to teach people around a table, right? But to actually show people how cool and how much fun it can be with people who are professionals who know how to do this stuff really well. I mean, as a game designer for many years, we would often say, you, the worst part about this is you can't package yourself in a box and teach people how to play, right? <laughs> There's really no good way to do it. But now but you can. Kind of stuff. There's lots yeah. Yeah to show people how to do it and whatever kind of a flavor they like and it's that's the reason they won the diana jones award this year really because i think it's just so inspiring to see this kind of thing and to watch it catch fire with people and again you're seeing it just fire their imaginations and it's just been so amazing to watch for it. sure and i always use the analogy like it's like you can't you know if, if learning how to play football or basketball you never learned by someone giving you a manual <laughs> right it was like here's here's the rules of baseball like right. that, you know be, be horrible to, to, to read. And D&D, &D, you know, obviously they were more evocative and there was more art in it, but like it's very similar kind of feel. It was very hard to, to get across what it was like to actually play in the game until people could either experience it themselves or watch people playing. And it's exactly. just been blown up since then. And yeah, it's the same thing for professional sports. You have people nowadays who watch football, never played football. Yeah. They watch baseball, never played baseball. But they watch and they enjoy it and they understand the strategy and the rules and everything else. And I think you're going to find that with Dungeons and Dragons. You're going to find people who don't play it, but yeah. they love watching it. Right. Yeah. And hopefully some of those people convert over to players and do amazing things that will blow us away that we couldn't possibly predict them now. Right. Right. That, that's, that's always the goal. The reason. One of the reasons you do this kind of stuff, just to see what happens. Right. That's really what gaming is about is trying to find those those amazing points that people can riff off of and watch other people's creativity just blow you away. For sure. 
And if we, I mean, you know, to 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 uh, uh, quote your, you from a couple of minutes ago, but like if we get one person to stay up late reading uh, about D and D, then we've done our jobs. There you go. Right. Exactly. Excellent. Yeah, I want them to lose sleep and be tired when they go to school or work the next morning. Yeah, that's what we Sorry want. <laughs> <laughs> Bunch of drowsy children. Stay Stop in school, you. kids. Yeah. <laughs> go to the library. Get these books. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for uh, calling in and talking to us. There's so much uh, uh, D&D material for kids of all ages with these Pick Your Path yes. uh, 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 Endless Quest books. If you're interested, go to your store, uh, right? Uh, most most uh, bookstores will have these uh, in stock, if not ask for them, uh, and get them where you can because I think they're a great way and a great gift for yes, that are. inquisitive, Open creative child uh, you know, this, uh, this, this coming year. It so it works. Thank you. Yeah. You check your friendly local gaming store too. I know a lot of those have them too. So. Oh, they do. Great. Uh, yeah, Excellent. Do that as well because, uh, we need more of those out there. Definitely. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. And, uh, hope to see you at game Con yep. this fall. That'd be fantastic. Shelly will. She'll I will be there. definitely see you. I'll definitely see Shelly. Hope to see Greg too. Yes, awesome. Me too. Right. Thank you. Take, Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Thanks. All of our literary folks. We are so literary. I feel like I want to go home and read a book. I feel like we should have worn berets and had red wine. Shall we be speaking in this accent? Yes, because we're literary. Whatever. We talked to two authors today. <laughs> we did. We did. Verily. Very prolific authors. I know, right? Not just like, hey, I wrote two books and uh, it's book. taken me it's seven years to come out with the next one. Right. It is like a book every two years or two books every or like four years. Four at a time. What? what the man does things in fours and not just four books that's like it is like 12 12 books, books in, in one, one. <laughs> we're yeah. like 12 short stories in one yep really and the and the failure the failure is is very eloquently done it's I like it. your blackness overcomes you um, and there you're done and out yeah so just it's a good lesson just like this podcast um, can this can be our outro. So, uh, Shelley, any parting words uh, after our mini, uh, interview here with uh, Mr. Matt Forbeck? Read a book. Read a book, kids. Read a book. And We're adults. We're putting out lots of great books. So we do are putting out lots of great books. Very exciting. Yeah. Get literary. Get, cool. Get read. Get read, kids. <laughs> and adults. Make it happen. Yeah. Um, where can people read about uh, all the fun things that you're doing, Shelly, speaking of reading? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Shelly Moo. Yes. You can find me on Facebook at Shelly Mazenoble Writer, because I'm a writer, too. <laughs> you are. You've written two books that were mm-hmm. published. Yeah. Go to that Facebook page. Don't go to the regular me page. It's super boring. Unless you want to hear about what's happening in The Bachelor in Paris. That is on my my other page. That's in your writer's page? Yeah. Oh, so don't go there. No, you want to go there. Because <laughs> you want to go there. Excellent. Well, Good stuff. You can follow me at Greg Tito. Uh, of course, if you want to find out about what we do here, go to DungeonsAndDragons.com. Oh, yeah. uh, find out everything that's going on in the world. We have lots of fun events and podcasts and streams happening here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash DND. We're in the midst of an awesome podcast of Waterdeep uh, yes. storyline that's being released on our Dungeon Delve, our sister RSS feed. Uh, search for that wherever you can, but there are 10 episodes with a cross-section of the D&D live play community doing tons of fun stuff. It's a continuous story, so I you want to go from idea. one uh, uh, episode to the other, but even if you are unable to do that, we do a brief recap, so you should be okay uh, jumping right in to listen to your favorite one. But there's extra bits if you are able to connect the dots and listen to all of them in the row, uh, which is super great. And it's a great way to introduce to all the fun storytelling that you can do in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, which is out in game stores now. Get a fantastic 256-page adventure that goes from levels 1 to 5 that Chris Perkins wrote with the help of some friends named James Intricasso and James Hake, uh, as well gotta as... Gotta be named James. I know. You gotta be named James. Uh, or Chris. To, to work on that. Or Chris. Yep. Or Matt Mercer, I guess. Yeah. He, he did some consulting James, on that book, too. Chris and Matt are the most common D&D names. I mean, Matt Forbeck, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, go. T- oh, we should have asked him how where uh, people can find him. I forgot to do that. Uh, but we oh, will list it in the sense. show notes as well as with his bio of all the fun ways that you can get in touch with Matt. Well, he's definitely he's doing. got a website. Uh, there, I know, he's at m Forbeck, I believe, on Twitter. Uh, so follow him there, and I believe that'll be it for this episode of Dragon Talk. It's Dragon Talk. And we are going to knock these down domino style. Ready? One, two, three. Oh! 
Oh, oh, oh. books fall, everyone dies. What a way to go. <laughs> we can just do this forever. <laughs> 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 <laughs>